Good morning and welcome as we gather here at Luminary United Methodist Church this morning for services. Uh, don't have a whole lot of announcements, a few I think that, that will uh, be helpful to you. Uh, we are going to start back with our in-person services next Sunday. We'll be having a service at 8 o'clock and at 10.30. Uh, the committee that's involved in that is busy planning and making sure we have everything set up and ready to go for the, those who choose to attend uh, and uh, we will be requiring, I understand, registration. That will be coming to you sometime this week, so you'll know that we'll need to get registered to be able to come and attend in person. But uh, looking forward to getting you all back together in the sanctuary, at least some of you, and beginning to move back to some, some normalcy as the COVID uh, count continues to drop in our area. Uh, also, um, I, I don't know if any of you noticed, but we have a new cross down in front of the church. There was a Lenten cross put up this week. Uh, I believe uh, John Drake and Wade and uh, uh, Lynn were involved in getting that up, and I appreciate the effort that was put into putting that up. Uh, the symbolism, I think most of you know that the purple means that Christ is hanging on the cross. The white means that Christ has been resurrected, and you'll see the white when we get to Easter. And we may be talking about some flowers or something, too, when we get, get to that point. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd let you know kind of what was going on. And uh, we will have service this afternoon at 3 o'clock out behind the church. understand the temperatures are going to be in the mid-50s, to upper 50s. It will be a little windy. I think uh, it's supposed to be right at 10 miles per hour, but it met the criteria that we set for having services, so we will have service at that time. Um, with that said, if you'll join me in the call to worship. When Jesus was in the wilderness, he was tempted to save himself. Jesus was offered salvation if he turned stones to bread, if he accepted wealth and power, if he tested God's commitment to him. In all these things, Jesus remained strong in his commitment to God. May our commitment be as strong. May our lives be placed in God's care and hand throughout our journey. Amen. Lord, who throughout these forty days for us did fast and pray, teach us with thee to mourn our sins. 
text content and it's the victory If you'll join me now as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come in the time now when we share our joys and concerns with each other, and we have prayer. I've got a couple updates, to, well, a few updates to give you. Uh, first off, I ask for continued prayer for Barbara Beeson. Uh, I think she's still at the hospital. I'm not sure. Dave, Dave called me last night. Um, the uh, aneurysm was small enough that they didn't think they needed to do a surgical intervention, but they will need uh, to watch her blood pressure and keep it under control. She had one once before, and I, I'd never heard of this before, but, but uh, Dave was telling me it healed itself. And uh, so that's a hopeful sign, I think, if she's got that capability, her body does. Also, uh, keep Ruth Mosier in prayer. Her surgery on Friday did go well. Um, they did get the stents in. She's with her daughter in Sweetwater, staying with her for a few days before she comes home. But uh, got some good news on that. And uh, I want to... Thank you all and thank God for the ability to go up and spend some time with my parents. I spent a couple of days with them. Got an opportunity to see my sister and, and brother-in-law, Billy. And Billy is, uh, he's doing pretty well. He's home now uh, and has gotten about 50, 50 pounds of fluid uh, off of his body. So he's actually able to walk and get around now. Uh, some, some pretty good improvement there. Um, are there some others we need to be praying for? Or other joys you want to lift up today? Wayne, our granddaughter uh, came down with COVID this week. Okay, Twinkle, what's your what's her name? Noe, N O E. Okay. We'll keep Noe in prayer. Pray that it'll be a minor case. Is it? How how is her symptom so far? Well, we know she lost her sense of taste, and I think she had fever and tiredness, and my. Son said he had a headache, so we'll check with him today and make okay. sure the rest of them are not getting it in the household. She's isolated upstairs, but never know. <laughs> I know it's a time of anxiety. Yeah, we'll be praying. We'll be praying for a twinkle. We will every thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Hey, Wayne. Yeah, Jeremy. Uh, Brenda Elcher, my niece, had to go to Children's yesterday. She had a little infection. Um, 
and they think that it will probably be healed with antibiotics, but if not, she might have to have a surgical intervention also. So okay. Just pray. Say, say her name again, will you, Jeremy? Brinley, B-R-Y-N-L-E-E. -E. Belcher. Belcher, okay. Wayne, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Uh, one correction, I believe we need to, we are starting church on March 7th, not next Sunday. Is it next Sunday at 7th? No, sir. Oh, thank you, Wayne. <laughs> I'm in a hurry. I wanted to get back in here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I talked with Dave this morning. Barbara was stable overnight. Uh, it, it looks good. They've been able to get her blood pressure up a little bit. So it's a, a good sign. She's going to still be there for a day or so. Uh, yeah, as soon as uh, they get that under control, her blood pressure, they're going to try to solve it with uh, drugs. Okay, thank you, Wayne. And if you all didn't catch that, uh, Wayne, Wayne caught it for me, and I praise God for that. We don't start back in the service until the 7th of March, not next weekend, but the weekend afterwards. We'll keep, uh, keep Barbara in prayer and hope that they'll get those drugs to get her blood pressure into, into right sync. Any others? Okay, well, let's, let's bow our heads and pray. day that you've given us. Rare we get a warm day like this one. And, and Lord, I got to tell you, after coming out of seven degrees yesterday morning, walking the dog, it's a pleasant experience to walk out this morning down back home. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and have services this afternoon as a result of that. Thank you for the opportunity to go up home and spend some time with my parents and, and uh, with family. And we ask you, and uh, Lord, help us to always be mindful of the good things that we receive from our families and from our communities and the grace that you give us day in and day out in our lives for the, uh, again, provision that you make for us, for the meaning you give to our lives as we love and as we strive to follow you and to do your will for your forgiveness, Lord. The fact that we can come to you as children and, and, and come to your knee and, and ask for your forgiveness, and not just your forgiveness, but the strength to overcome so many of the things in our lives that, that, that hurt us and hurt others through the power of your love. We praise you and we thank you. Most of all, I guess we thank you, Lord, for the example you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ, and our brother. As he walked the earth, as he lived on the earth, as he, as he taught us how to love each other the way you had intended for us to love each other. Help us to keep our eyes on him, especially during this time of Lent, to, to, to remind ourselves through scripture, through prayer, through uh, remembering the stories of exactly who we are to be and how we're supposed to love each other. We thank you, Lord, that you did intervene in, in uh human existence and meet us with your grace and your love and your forgiveness. We thank you, Lord, that that Barbara's situation wasn't worse. We know these aneurysms can be very deadly at times. And we praise you that you left her with us, that we, we didn't lose that person from our community. Dave didn't lose a, a wife. Their children didn't lose a mother, grandmother. And we praise you and thank you for your grace, Lord, in this situation. We thank you for Ruth having a, a daughter to go to after the stents were put into her legs and having a lot of prayers going up for her and, and, and good medical care to make that happen. We thank you, Lord, that a group got together, uh, well, a couple groups. One got together to see that a cross would go up in front of our church to represent you, to remind people as they go up and down the road what season it is and that God's love is always there for them. But also the group that, that gathered on Zoom on Thursday to discuss uh, reopening your building. Bless our efforts, Lord. Help us to do your work. Help us to keep everybody safe and yet make it a place where they can see your face. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for every good thing that you're doing. We lift up Twinkle's uh, granddaughter, Noe, 
and her family right now. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with them and help help them make those symptoms minor. Continue, Lord, to spread that that vaccine, uh, get it in to me- as many people as possible, and and Lord, please make it effective in protecting those that receive it. Be with uh, Brenda's Belcher, Jeremy's niece. I think that's right. You know, even if I don't, Lord. We pray that those antibiotics will be able to take care of the infection, will be able to, to drive it from the body, that they won't have to do a, a surgical intervention. But, Lord, we know that you work through mysterious ways. We don't always understand them. We pray that if it is necessary, that you send the very best medical help to restore, restore health and, and to take care of the problem. I praise you, Lord, that my, my brother-in-law is doing better, that my sister's able to handle her job and to look after him and as changes have taken place. And Lord, I just give you all my love and all the glory. I guess we all do. We praise you and thank you. As we pray the prayer you taught us so long ago, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Merciful Father, we have been blessed this week. We've been blessed in many, many ways. Blessed as a church, blessed as a people, blessed as a community. You gave us jobs when we needed them. Most of us have worked jobs and and provided for our families through the grace, through your grace. We've been able to support uh, our communities, uh, many different functions, many different good things that are going on, ways that people are being loved and cared for. And as part of that, we have supported your church, your body on earth. We praise you and thank you for the ability to support you, to lift you up, to help others to see the grace and the blessings of having a relationship with Christ. Use the money uh, that was sent in this week for that purpose, that in some way people's lives will be improved. People will know you better. People will come out of this Lent uh, a little bit under better understanding of the grace and the love of Christ. That's what we pray for. So bless the money we've received, the time that has been put in here, the thought that's been put in in meetings and making things happen. Just bless it, Lord that it might continue to make a difference in people's lives, that it might, uh, might shower your love on our community. That's what we pray for. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.
Scripture today comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter uh, 4, 1 through 13. Listen as we read God's Word. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he w- had, was famished. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become a loaf of bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instance all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until a more opportune time. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I love this passage, and it doesn't, you know, it's a good, I think it's appropriate that it comes in the first Sunday of Lent as we come together here. It's not surprising that the lectionary takes me to the temptations of Christ this, uh, this Sunday. For in doing so, it really brings you and me uh, to what I believe are the root failures of Israel uh, that led to Christ's incarnation. And probably our three greatest reasons for sin today also, as I think about it. As I think about my life, my experience, and, and understanding the scriptures, and, and watching, watching the Hebrews in the Old Testament, and, and kind of how they acted out at times, kind of makes it all plain, I think. Now, I would define sin as a decision to withhold love from God and others. That's what sin basically is. To make oneself God, in a sense, in, in our own minds and by placing ourselves and our well-being above the well-being of everybody else. And that's kind of what the devil tempts Jesus with as we come into this passage today. We're told that the majority, by the majority of the Gospels that immediately following the theophany of the baptism of Christ, he's led into the wilderness. And so the Spirit leads him into the wilderness, into the desert, where he will fast for 40 days. It's not surprising that those 40 days also correspond to the 40 years that the Israelites were roaming around the desert before they entered the Promised Land. The area that he went to is believed to have been west of, of, of the Sea of Galilee, in the upland, hilly region, a rocky region, there's even a cave where they claim they believe that he, he, he hang, hung out in while he was going through these temptations. And, and it's an area that usually gets very little rain, and during certain times of the year, it doesn't get any rain at all. That's caused by the upland areas along the coast of the Mediterranean. As, as fronts come through, they drop their, their rain there, and there's a rain shadow 
that occurs as it moves on out uh, to the east. So the first temptation the devil tells us is that, you know, Jesus is, is, is totally famished. He's been out in the desert for 40 days, uh, and he hasn't eaten. And, and the devil tempts him. He says, hey, you know, there's all these nice rocks around here. Uh, why don't you just command your father to turn one of these into bread, and you'll have the bread you need. And, and that's one of the things I've, I've struggled with at times. I struggle with it today, to be quite honest with you, a little bit as, as Sandy and I approach uh, retirement. One of, the, one of the big issues for retirees, of course, is whether our money is going to last as long as we do. Whether we're going to have a roof over our head, whether we're going to have food in our bellies, whether we're going to have clothes on our back, whether God is going to provide. And in, even in our country today, we have areas where there is, there is uh, people don't have enough to eat. It's usually through a, uh, some strange reasons, but it, it occurs. And as you move out into the rest of the world where the average person lives on, on $5 or less a day, you kind of understand that there is a great deal of insecurity around provision. And in our hearts, it's awful easy to go down that road. You know, just, just think about it. Uh, one of the biggest discussions at the end of conference every year is, you know, who got which parsonage in, for, between the preachers? Who got the choicest appointments? It happens. I used to wonder as I, I would look out at, at, the, at my garden in Norris, and I'd think to myself, what would happen if all the technology of the world was to go down tomorrow and there was no food in the grocery stores, and all of a sudden people started coming out from, from Knoxville and started raiding my garden? What would I do as the provider for my family? Would I pick up my gun? Would I defend it? And I don't think any of us knows that until we're in, our, we're in that particular situation. Get between our livelihood and us, and, and you'll see some strange things begin to happen in human beings. It's a fact. Happened to Israel, too. Remember, they were in the desert for 40 years, and, and, they, didn't, and, and they didn't have to be out there very long before they started whining about what? God, you're going to give us water? You're going to give us something to drink? God, you're going to provide some sort of bread for us? And even after they got the bread, they said, you know, this bread's getting kind of old, God. Where's the meat at? You know? And so it is, it is the root of a lot of sin in the world, I believe, is our distrust in God's ability to provide. And yet the Bible says what? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Doesn't it? And it tells us that even the sparrow, uh, God cares about the sparrow, which neither sows nor reaps, right? And, he, and, he, and he's adorned the flowers in and, 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 and such beauty, and yet they're here today and they're burned tomorrow. You know, as you, you listen to this, I think what we need to understand is that God's faith, faith in God's word, even in times of scarcity, can get us through. And I think that's what it's pointing at. And that God will provide what we need when we need it. But we as human beings struggle with that. Jesus passed the test, didn't he? When Israel couldn't pass the test, when Wayne Hedry couldn't pass the test, Jesus passed it, you know? Devil then, you know, of course, takes him up on a mountaintop and, and says, I want you to see all the kingdoms of the world. Look at all these beautiful kingdoms, all this. You just bow down and worship me. And I, remember, Jesus, the devil is the great deceiver. That's another meaning of the word. He lies about what he can do and what he can't do. And he, and he says, you just bow down. This is all mine. I have all this, and you, I'll just give it to you. The second part, I think, of, of, of our fallibility as human beings, a second thing to be introspective of as we go through Lent to think about is, you know, what would we do? If somebody came to us and told us that our lives had no meaning whatsoever. There's no purpose for you. There's no reason. All your suffering was pointless. Everything you did meant nothing. I think that's what the devil's pushing at. He says, if you just bow down to me, I'll give your life meaning. I'll make you the most relevant human being on this earth. And let's face it, we have a screwed up way of looking at 
relativity in this world. It, it's the athletes and the movie stars as opposed to the teachers and the doctors often and others that, that are thought of being important, right? We do. But if you disrespect somebody, look out. Because even in disrespect, you can see sin just absolutely flourish when they feel disrespected, can't you? Just as wars are fought over, over resources, they're sometimes fought over disrespect. I believe one of the main reasons Adolf Hitler was able to get the power in Germany was because of the way the world disrespected Germany after World War I. Paul, we put our pride in, in other things, put our pride in our, in our nationalism, we, in, our, in our prowess. When somebody gets in between those things we put our pride in, then look out again. It can create a mess. It really can. See it in sibling rivalry. When a parent is thought to love one child more than another, just see what happens in a family. It's a fact. But Jesus passed that, didn't he? He passed that one too. The final test came with throw your body off this, off the temple, the, the top of the temple, and surely your father will send his angels to bear you up and keep you from dashing your foot at the, you know, one of the biggest issues right before the Exodus, before the the Hebrews are forced out of their land was the fact that they were taking God for granted. Archaeologists tell us that if you go in most uh, archaeological digs prior to the Exodus, you will find other gods in their houses, minor gods, usually gods of, uh, uh, of uh, productivity. That's the way I know to put it. Gods that would bring economic blessings and, and enlarge your family. Those type gods. But there's something interesting when you go past the Exodus and they do archaeological, guess what they don't find? They don't find those minor gods and those digs. They're not there. See, they got to the point where they believed they were God's chosen people to the point that, that they really didn't need to invest in, in a relationship with God at all. God was going to bless them no matter what. They were God's chosen people. And so a relationship with God was not all that important. And, and they began to branch out into other... Uh, Lesser gods, I think, as a result of that. It's interesting to me when, when a bunch of us Methodist preachers gather, and I guess it happens in every denomination, we can be really, really spiritually smug, I guess is the best way I know to put it. We can, we can begin to say, how can those poor Baptists believe that way? Right? How can they believe that to be true? You know? We've got the right answer. One thing I am convinced of after 23 years is, is uh, <laughs> that's the wrong attitude. I think, uh, I think that God uses every denomination. I think we need to approach God in awe and humility and understanding that there's always something new something better way of understanding, new way of growing. That's what I found in my life. I still feel very insufficient standing behind this pulpit every Sunday. I study, I try to learn, but when you stand in the shadow of the creator of the universe, how can you feel anything but all in humility. And yet, sometimes we take God for granted. We think we got it all figured out. That's one of the reasons I think that the Sunday schools are not full and our churches aren't full. Because you believe that God's going to save you regardless of whether you have a relationship with him or not. I think that's, uh, that's stretching it just a bit. It's his grace that makes it possible. It's Christ's death on the cross that makes it all possible. But we are also called to walk through the door and accept it. 
to have a relationship with God, to read scripture, to study God, to try to understand who he is, to understand, you know? And yet it's so easy to become apathetic, to sit back, to just watch it go by. Especially when times are good. And our country has had a lot of good times, if it's right down to it. And this makes me worried. I mean, these are things I think about, and I don't, I don't think about them about you. I try to think them about me. What would I do if somebody was to get between me and my paycheck? What would I do if, if uh, <laughs> things got really bad? Would I trust God or would I trust my own ability and somebody else? Do I ever take God for granted? Do I think I got it all figured out? I don't think I cross that one too much, but sometimes maybe. And I think about that, and I pray around those things. I pray that I won't do that. But you know what? I'm made of flesh. And I'm pretty sure that while Jesus defeated all these things, and the Hebrews failed with all these things, Wayne would fail with these things too. And that's where we get to the good news. The good news is that Jesus didn't fail these things. The good news is that Jesus faced the devil and he passed them all. And when he came to the greatest test, which was his crucifixion, he passed that one too. The good news is that we can close with Christ. We can have a relationship with Christ. We can receive the love and the grace of Christ. And if we reflect that back out to our hearts, which I know you all do, and I know I do, that, that changes us. We, we'll never be, I don't think, fully in the image of Christ this side of heaven. But he definitely gives us power to overcome and freedom from our sins and the promise of a better life coming and a better life now. And that's good news for somebody like me who wonders if I'm going to stand up and people start to raid my, my garden and wonders if, if I'll ever get so disgusted with my life to want to throw it away and wonders if, you know, if I'm not spiritually proud sometimes. Yeah, I'm going to fail those tests. I have failed those tests. But Jesus Christ passed them. And he's my brother. And he's told me that dad loves me despite failing those tests. And God, dad, wants me to live with him. And that's the good news, isn't it? That we don't have to live under the curse of the Israelites. That we live under the blessings of Jesus Christ instead. And that allows me to have a pretty good disposition and attitude and smile on my face on most days. And I hope it does you too. Don't forget to think about these things through Lent. I think they will cause you to draw closer to God and bless you. That's the reason I say that. And embrace him. Embrace him with both your arms. Don't one arm or embrace him. Embrace him. You know, they teach us in, in preacher school, if we're going to hug a, a lady and she wants to be hugged, we hug her from the side. You don't hug them from the front, right? Because that might send the wrong signals. But I think in the case of Jesus, in the case of, of our Father in heaven, you need to give him a great big bear hug, right? The one maybe you gave your aunt or your grandmother or your parents, that sort of hug. That's how close we need to get. Because it can't do anything in the world to you except for bless you. That's what I would argue. So this week, just be thinking about that. Thinking about that big hug that we need to all be given as we go through Lent. I would say amen, but I don't know anybody will amen me back. I'll just leave it at that, okay? <laughs> Although, let me tell you, Roxanne and uh, Brianna are a big help when we're doing readings because... Without them responding, I'd be completely lost. <laughs>
Join me as we do the benediction. I think we'll do it together today. The journey has begun. God is with you. Go forth to learn, to teach, to serve. Go bringing peace and hope in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.